Kia ora and welcome to this video update on the Tasman District Council Landscapes and Coastal Environment Projects. These two projects seek to identify and provide a protection framework for the district's outstanding natural landscapes, outstanding natural features and coastal environment area. Today, I'm joined by Anna McKenzie, who is the Tasman District Council Project Manager and has taken over from Jeremy Butler, who kickstarted this project earlier this year. We also have with us the Tasman District Landscape Study author, Bridget Gilbert, and the Tasman District Coastal Environment Study author, James Bentley. Finally, we're joined by a senior planner, Stephanie Stiles, and Stephanie is responsible for developing the concept rules that will ultimately apply to these identified areas. Today, we're going to reflect on the progress to date. So it's December 2021. And we're going to look at what we've learned and we're going to look ahead to what's next for these projects in 2022. I now pass you over to Anna McKenzie, who's going to remind us how these projects fit with the Council's Eoriri Ki Uta Eoriri Kitai Tasman Environment Plan creation. And she'll also give us um, a bit of an overview of some of the engagement work that happened this year. Thank you, Anna. The Tasman Environment Plan will replace the existing resource management plans, um, which are the, uh, the Tasman Regional Policy Statement and the Tasman Resource Management Plan. An important part of the process in creating the Tasman Environment Plan is identifying the district's special places and giving them extra protection to help preserve the uniqueness of the environment, the area's history, and provide people with access to the outdoors. The landscape and coastal environment project is just one component of this process, and this, this project is slightly ahead of some of the other um, components of um, the Tasman Environment Plan. We've been moving quite fast um, with this process. Um, and over the last year, the project team has undertaken quite extensive engagement. Um, we've, we've had our challenges with the COVID situation. However, we have heard from over 300 individuals and groups during the engagement. And the engagement that we've done to date has included four webinars, um, 13 open days, events and public meetings across the district. Um, this was during late May and early July, this, um, early June this year. Uh, we've had numerous face-to-face -face and virtual meetings with groups and landowners um, in June, July and August this year. Um, and these were to follow up on the open day events um, that we held in May and early June. Um, as well as this, we've, um, we've fielded numerous emails and phone calls um, with groups and, and individual landowners um, throughout the year. Um, and this has helped us gather information, helped us explain the process and get more feedback around um, the process and the landscape and coastal environment reports that have been um, drafted to date. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Bridget, who prepared the landscape report for the project, and she's going to explain a bit more about, about that process. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, yes, so I'm a, uh, my name's Bridget Gilbert. I'm a landscape architect, um, an independent landscape architect based in Auckland. Um, and just as a bit of a recap, um, Anna's touched on it, that... My role in the project has been to determine the outstanding natural landscapes and features across the district. Um, and those are areas that are identified to have special values of such a degree that they are outstanding. Um, this is a methodology through the court um, over the past 30 years or so of the RMA. Um, the assessment considers the level of naturalness and other values, including ecology, perception, cultural and historic values, and the way an area is used. We are required by law to recognise and provide for the protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes from inappropriate subdivision use and development. So in terms of the um, engagement process that we've been through to date, um, a couple of really important messages came through for me. Firstly, we heard from the community that they rightly consider that they are looking after the landscape well. As a landscape architect, I couldn't agree more. These are outstanding natural landscapes and it's how people are looking after them 
that have made them um, continue to be of that ranking. So with that in mind, it's really fundamental that me as a landscape expert works with the landowners. Second point probably is that people are worried about the introduction of the landscape overlays um, in that they may hinder their ability to use their land in a reasonable manner and result in expensive consenting processes for land use change and new buildings. Thirdly, we also heard that you are all concerned that the boundaries of the landscape overlays are incorrect in some locations and that the overlays may prevent people from continuing existing land uses and activities on your land. Over the last couple of months, we've closely examined the landscape overlay boundaries and amended them where technically possible. This has resulted in several very fine grained mapping changes, generally around the edges of the landscape overlays to exclude areas of forestry, pasture, weed dominated scrub and buildings. In some locations, the analysis of whether the land can be excluded from the overlay is more difficult and it is intended to make site visits in early 2022 to confirm the mapping on the ground. This is particularly applies to land on the eastern side of the Tarkaka Valley and throughout the northwestern portion of Golden Bay, and I suspect also some of the areas around Murchison and St Arnold. We have also amended the ONFL schedules to add in existing activities that are occurring on the land as you have advised us and which clearly are of a scale and character that is not problematic from a landscape effects perspective. People have told us that they want simple and meaningful rules that enable appropriate development. And they've also expressed a desire for good development, such as things like landscape restoration to be encouraged by the plan. So with that in mind, I've also provided input into the concept rules that Stephanie has been working on. Thank you, Bridget. James, would you mind talking us through your experience with the coastal environment? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, so my name is James Bentley. I'm a consultant landscape architect who was the lead author of the uh, coastal environment um, document. And specifically, the coastal environment document looked at two things. One of them was the extent of the coastal environment. And the second thing was the degree of natural character within that coastal environment. And of course, the coastal environment includes the entire coastal marine area out to 12 nautical miles, um, as well as a small slither of land, um, which extends to this significant um, extent inland of where coastal elements, patterns and processes extend to. So uh, that's not an easily um, identifiable piece of work to do, uh, particularly the land-based stuff. Um, so lots of technical studies um, and engagement uh, with the community has really assisted to uh, reinforce the framework and reinforce the values and the output of that study. Um, so that was extremely helpful. Um, the Engagement process has been invaluable, I think, from, from my point of view, particularly uh, understanding the extent of current processes that are occurring in the coastal environment, um, particularly under the current district plan. Um, and I think at the moment there is the, obviously the 200 metre coastal environment line um, and how that can um, assist and not assist in terms of getting development through. Uh, so we've been told quite clearly that people want a more simple and meaningful rule setup and framework that assists development in appropriate locations. Um, but we're also there mindful that it's not just the coastal environment, potential rules or, or restrictions on development. It's also other stuff such as climate change and coastal hazards play an important part in that process. Um, also to align with what Bridget's just been saying, um, the coastal policy statement in terms of landscape also extends into the marine environment and the coastal environment area. So, you know, there could be restrictions um, with outstanding natural landscapes as well. Um, coastal hazards, as I've said, will take a priority over certain areas within the coastal environment. 
But in terms of the feedback, I think that it's been extremely helpful to receive all the feedback from the community. That's provided um, a very um, enabling approach to verify certain parts of the coastal environment document where there were some areas that we felt needed to be um, further technically um, updated and where certain uh, discussions on the extent of the coastal environment line was um, we've really carefully scrutinized those areas particularly through site visit opportunities and of course there are some more potentially to come next year but also we've updated those lines where we can technically support um, those amendments um, that are consistent with the methodology that we've um, put, put in place. Um, and that goes against the coastal environment line as much as the natural character data that we've also received. Um, so, and, and what we've been doing since those engagement processes is, is updating the study, updating the lines, very much similar to what Bridget's been doing, updating the schedules, so there's some depth behind how those lines were determined, and also, in some areas, reinforcing the methodology so it's more clearer, more concise around an understanding how we got to certain conclusions. But also, like Bridget, I've been very much um, assisting staff in, in the development of the concept rules around what is appropriate and what, what is not appropriate in terms of the coastal environment line. And, and that's been extremely helpful in terms of, um, I think, developing draft or at least draft ideas around rules. Thanks, James. Um, and that leads us on really nicely to hear from Stephanie about the development of the concept rules. I think we're all really keen to know how that's, that's progressing. Just before we do, um, a quick reminder that these concept rules do not apply to the existing legally established activities that are being undertaken at present. So the rules will apply to new activities or a change in use that's beyond your existing user rights um, or where a consent has lapsed or expired. Um, so keeping that in mind, Stephanie, can you please give us an update? Thank you, Nicole, and thank you for clarifying that really important point. Hi, everyone. Um, some of you will have met me. I'm the consultant planner working with the team on this project. And I guess you could say my challenge here is to translate and interpret what we've got in terms of the technical reports from James and Bridget and those identification of areas and values into a planning framework, including objectives and policies for protection and management of the land, but also the rules which will apply to these areas. And it's, it's been a wonderful process working through with the landowners. We, we met a lot of landowners, land managers, stakeholders out in the community and really got to talk about what people are doing on the land now and what their aspirations for the future are. It's very clear that people have a lot of ideas and aspirations for what they want to do on their properties and really need flexibility around what the rules will apply to and, and the ability to change land use over time. In response to everything we've learned, we've developed a set of high-level conceptual rules. So they're based on the feedback, obviously based on the technical work that James and Bridget have undertaken. They're also grounded in the current operative rules under the current resource management planning framework for the district in taking into account modern comparable provisions in other plans that are being developed around the country and case law that's developing. So we've, we've looked at all of these different areas to set up a rule framework and we've reality tested that with various groups of people to, to see what it would mean on the ground. One of the things that we really heard from the community when we were talking to people was the strong support for tailoring rules to recognise the differences between the different ONL areas. They're, they're vastly different landscapes, outstanding for different reasons, and they vary from, like, for example, the wide open pastoral areas on the northwest coast of the district through to the deep valleys and forested areas and towards Murchison and the lakes. And many people recognised the need for the rules to be different in each of these areas to recognise those different values. And we agree with this approach and we've, we've tailored the concept rules to that. So, for example, one of the approaches that we've been looking at is clustering of buildings in those large open landscapes to be based around where there's existing modification rather than spreading modification widely across the areas. 
this enables people to continue to develop their land, but in a way that is restricted to areas that are going to have less impact on the values of the wider landscapes. We also heard from the community that people want greater certainty in the rules. They really want to know what can be done as a permitted activity and without the need for a resource consent. In other words, what activities are considered appropriate in these areas? We've specifically considered what activities could be a permitted activity, and those are really grounded in the things that will not have a significant impact on the identified values. Again, anchoring new development adjacent to existing modification acts to help reduce the impacts on a wider area. In terms of the outstanding natural features, as you'll be well aware, those are generally geologically based. And so the rules are very much tailored to focus on the activities that affect those geological values. So things like earthworks, mineral extraction, and those kind of things aren't going to be a good mix with things like cave systems. So really focusing the rules on what the values and threats are. The conceptual rules can't be advanced to the, the end conclusion in a particularly short time frame because the other key thing about them is the integration with other parts of the environment plan that are being developed. So things like the protection of biodiversity values really factors into landscape values and those other work streams with hazards, infrastructure, land disturbance and the like are really going to be in developed next year. So we'll be really watching what happens with those and connecting through to those. In terms of the conceptual rules, I guess the key element to express to you is the, the need for those to focus on activities that are going to damage the identified values that make these areas special. So it's, it's large scale changes, really prominent buildings, um, really big changes to land use. And where there's uncertainty in what the effect an activity might have on those landscape values, what we are trying to develop is provisions where rules allow a discussion around whether a proposal is the right thing in the right place, or if it can be changed or conditions so that it can be able to fit the site or the values of that surrounding landscape. And that's the, the challenge we're continuing to work towards. Thank you, Stephanie. So we're now going to move over to a quick fire question round um, so that we can hear from you all um, about some of your highlights, some of the challenges um, and where to next with this project. So the first question is really, What's been the highlight of this engagement? Um, and this could be from working with landowners, you've been working with EMI, you've been working with stakeholders, um, you've been getting out and about across the district. I'll go to you first, Stephanie. What's been the highlight? Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, as you said, it's, it's meeting people, it's working with all of those interested parties and really understanding more about what people are doing on the land now and what the aspirations for the future are. Great. And Anna? Uh, getting to know the district in more detail and visiting the district's special places and meeting the people that live in those special places has been a real highlight for me. James. Thanks, uh, Nicole. I think possibly um, this is one of the most engaged um, group of people that um, I've been fortunate to uh, be with in the country around the coastal environment. Um, understanding the passion around where you live and work in the coastal environment and how that affects your life. So that's been really valuable to understand further about that. Great. And Bridget? Thanks, Nicole. Um, yes, I guess for me, the highlight has been meeting all the um, wonderful people who own these, um, own and manage these um, magnificent landscapes throughout Tasman and uh, getting a better idea of the challenges that you're all facing in that landscape management. So, yeah. Thank you. And that leads us on nicely to our second question, um, which is around what's been the most challenging aspect um, of these projects um, so far um, to date? So I'll change our order slightly um, and go straight to you first, Anna. Um, as a project manager, um, how have you found um, the, the project management to date? 
Oh, the project management has been quite um, difficult with this project with co the COVID situation and trying to arrange um, engagement um, around that and making sure that we um, we get to as many people as possible um, through through our engagement and being um, held up um, with several of our events because of COVID. Um, the other challenge is the huge volume of um, responses and feedback we've had from um, the community and trying to respond to that as, as, as quickly as we're able to. Um, it's been, as um, James indicated, it's been a really engaged community and we've had a lot of feedback. Um, so managing, managing all that f feedback and ensuring that, um, that we're all across that feedback has been a, a challenge. Yeah, I know COVID has um, impacted timelines somewhat. Um, Bridget, can you speak any more to that? Look, I think it's just building on that. I'm based in Tamaki Makara, Auckland. So I had hoped by this stage in the project to have visited many of the um, landowners' properties and look closely on the ground at whether we've got the ONL lines correct, whether we're, um, we need to amend things in the ONL our schedules and ONF schedules um, and just work through that on a, a more one-on-one -on -one, um, process. Um, but, you know, with luck, we're going to be doing that shortly in the new year. Yeah, and we were really fortunate to be able to get out um, in, in a bit of a window, really, of opportunity um, mm -hmm. earlier this year and, and do some of that on-the-ground um, engagement and, and have those conversations. James? What's been the what's uh, been the most challenging yeah. thing for you? I think I've I share those concerns. Um, we're living in difficult times at the moment, but I also think that um, the, the 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 technical side of the reports that both Bridget and I have been involved with, it's uh, that there are a lot of technicalities in those, a lot of uh, jargon as well, uh, and it's often difficult to translate that into um, everyday speak that people understand because landscapes and coastal environments are close to the heart of a lot of people and they've all got their own interpretations of what that means for them. So balancing all of those concerns with those of the broader district have, have really been a challenge, I think. So, But I think we're going to get some great outcomes. Oh, and Stephanie? For, for me, beyond all of those challenges that the others have articulated, the, the real challenge was trying to start a process of integrating and balancing the requirements of the legislation and the council's role for providing protection to these really special areas with enabling people to go about their day-to-day their -day lives, to keep operating their properties the way they do, and, and to look at what kind of appropriate uses can be continued and changed on private land in the future while still protecting special values. Yeah. And so I guess that leads us really nicely into next steps. So looking ahead to next year, um, some of those concept rules that you've been talking us through, Stephanie, what's next with, with that? What are the next um, steps for each of you to continue to progress this project? So for myself, they, it's really a case of, keeping up to date with the conversations that Bridget and James have on the ground and those changes to the technical reports and feeding that into the conceptual rule approach. But looking further ahead, a, a really key part of this work is going to be integrating these landscape, natural character and coastal elements with all of the rest of the Tasman Environment Plan development. So really figuring out how these special areas work with all of the other rules that are in the plan around land disturbance and biodiversity, hazards, and all those other various topics that, that touch on what we've been talking about in these work streams. And Anna, what's next in terms of um, steps for updating the mapping um, and, and hopefully getting back out to, to our communities? Yeah, we were hoping to have the um, updated maps um, with um, uh, publicised um, before the end of the year. However, um, due to restrictions, um, we haven't been able to get out all of the um, communities and land, land um, that we wanted to have another look at. Um, so, so we are um, we won't be finalising that work until we've managed to get out on site, um, and that is going to be later 
around March, April next year, we're hoping we may be able to finish those site visits. Um, and then we intend to come out and do more engagement um, and talk to people about the concept um, draft rules that Stephanie has, has developed up and get some feedback on them. And then once we've got that package, we'll hopefully um, be in a position to release um, an, another series of draft maps out for um, public feedback. Great. And Bridget and James, anything else to add about next year, what you're looking forward to? From my, my perspective, it's really getting out into the field again and having um, having a good, cl good close look at things and talking it through with the landowners um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's just finalising finalising all this good work that we've been doing um, and um, moving forward into the next stages of the plan. Thank you. Well, that wraps up um, this December 2021 update um, on the landscapes and coastal environment projects. Um, you can head over to our website, the environmentplan.tasman.govt.nz website, um, go to the engagement tab and find the landscapes and coastal environment projects there. There's more information, a really extensive frequently asked questions section um, and the summary of feedback that we've received to date. So go over and check that out and hopefully we will see you in the new year. <laughs>